Lecture 1. Introduction. We live in an age of affluence and physical comfort. We drive bulky SUVs, talk insensately over our cell phones, amuse ourselves with DVDs, eat at restaurants more often than at home. We expect all the amenities of life as our birthright. Yet many of us feel dissatisfied and spiritually empty. What is wrong? What is it? Is something lacking from our lives? If so, is it just that we need more of what we already have a lot of? Or do we need something radically different? What do you think? Do we need a different way of looking at the world around us and at ourselves? Do we need a sense of purpose that has nothing to do with machine and comfort? Do we need a sense of purpose that has nothing at all to do with technology and machines and comforts? Do we need knowledge of what is really important in life? Confidence that such knowledge is available to us? And skill to put that knowledge into practical use? We have become remarkably successful at manipulating physical laws. With radio, television, radar, computers, the internet, the world wide web, and other electronic devices, we have conquered distance and time. In travel, even into outer space, we have attained an unprecedented degree of efficiency and speed. Think about it. Think about how high we've reached. Dozens of sophisticated instruments orbit the Earth sending us information on conditions and events of which we would otherwise be quite ignorant or carrying messages instantaneously from one hemisphere to the other. We are rightly thankful for achievements that demonstrate so clearly humanity's intelligent persistence in probing the secrets of our immeasurably rich and complex universe and in making useful the forces with which it abounds. In such achievements, exitude and precision are essential criteria, and personal emotions are irrelevant. They are irrelevant to technological progress. But when it comes to living, the story is different. In our relations with other human beings, in concern for our own health, in our work and our leisure, we do not apply the same intelligence and realism. Why not? Why not? Perhaps, by the very nature of living, we cannot be as precise as we can in measuring physical processes. Perhaps, the process of living is quite different from science and technology because it requires another sort of view and other ways of relating to the world. Despite our progress in science and technology, we have not yet probed the most important aspects of life, the mysteries of birth and death, of joy and sorrow, of freedom and fate, with the same intensity we have used in investigating the physical universe. Today, the world is changing in bewildering rapidity, not just in technology, but in how we look at it as well. New scientific theories and discoveries are finding their place in the body of human knowledge. New philosophies are making a bid for the allegiance of the human mind. Strange and startling ideas are emerging in religion Studies in psychology are uncovering the vast and intricate potentials of human consciousness. We are living in a time of a paradigm shift, in a punctuation of our normal stable equilibrium. Forced out of the tight compartments of traditional beliefs into this inescapable vortex of change, we may feel lost and confused. Teach 
teachings that once we did not question will not longer support us. Nor can we find a firm footing in our achievements in the physical universe. We seek for meaning and direction in our lives, for deeper understanding of our own natures, for some insight into the great and primary mysteries of life itself. We feel intuitively that there must be at the heart of things something fundamentally true and eternal, something that endures through all evolutionary changes, something of which those changes are themselves only expressions. This study course in Theosophy is offered in the hope of helping students to find meaning in the midst of life's confusions. H. P. Blavatsky, one of the founders of the Theosophical Society, wrote, Theosophy is the shortless ocean of universal truth. Love and wisdom reflecting its radiance upon earth. The Theosophical Society was formed to show mankind that it exists. To be sure, this shortless ocean is not the exclusive possession of the Theosophical Society. It exists everywhere and has always been available to the fearlessly questing mind. Some of the central concepts of this universal truth have, however, been formulated more specifically in the literature of Theosophy than elsewhere, and their totality is coherently set forth in Theosophy, which has a special relevance to our times. It is a therefore without dogmatic claim. Only basic information can be presented here. The student should keep in mind also that the explanations given here are presented as hypotheses for consideration, not as ultimate pronouncements of any of the various subjects, because these ideas are metaphysical or beyond the physical. They are not subject to laboratory proof and they need not be accepted as irrefutable. If, however, they ring true, and can be verified by your own experience, they will throw light on many otherwise insoluble problems and, in that way, can prove to be guide stones to further progress on the path of life. The words of Khalil Gibran in his essay of self-knowledge are appropriate to keep in mind in pursuing this study. Say not, I have found the truth. But rather, I have found a truth. Say not, I have found the path of the soul. But rather say, I have met the soul walking upon the path. H. B. Blavatsky has been reported as saying that the study of the great universal principles of theosophy requires a special kind of mental effort that involves, quote, the carving out of new brain paths. It's not always easy for us with our conditioned minds to submit to so rigorous an undertaking. But once we have overcome our reluctance and inertia, we may find it the most exciting adventure of our lives. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed the, the little introduction. So in section one of the course, we will talk about what is Theosophy, we'll talk about it as a religion and a science. In section two, we'll talk about the ancient wisdom in the modern world, about the history and the, the society's activities and all of the things related to the society. On section three, we'll talk about the universal brotherhood. We'll talk about this concept of brotherhood and evolution and the path of the brotherhood and the one versus the brotherhood and all of that. In the Section number four, we'll talk about human beings and our bodies. This is going deeper into the teaching. We'll talk about 
our bodies and the, the fields of energy. We'll talk about the etheric double, the emotional body, mental body, casual body, and all of those types of things. And section five, we'll talk about life after death. We'll talk about dying and the etheric body. Talk about the emotional body in life after death. Talk about the Davachan and the mental body. And we'll talk about the casual body between uh, incarnations. In the next section, we'll talk about reincarnation. Talk about reincarnation and evolution. About the explanatory power of reincarnation. About past lives, memory of past lives. And who or what determines the circumstances of uh, rebirth. And the uh, evidence of reincarnation. Alright, and in the last section, We'll talk about karma, we'll talk about misconceptions about karma, we'll talk about karma as a universal law, about distributive karma, karma as an opportunity for the living, and that's basically that. That's the course, it's full of uh, goodies, full of great information, and I hope you'll choose to join me, and it will be awesome.